being recorded so that you can find it um, after uh, after we're done. It takes us a few days just to get it up on our website, but it is being recorded if uh, you miss bits and pieces or if you want to see it again. All the other recordings are also up on our website. Um, please consider making a donation to uh, for participating in this webinar. Uh, the proceeds from your donation, they not only go to supporting the museum and this webinar, but also to an educational scholarship. Uh, it is the Vanden Bush Scholarship for a local student uh, to go to college. Um, you can make those donations by going to CrestedButteMuseum.com, or you could always send a check to P.O. Box uh, 2480, Crested Butte, Colorado 81224. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we are experiencing some minor technical difficulties this evening. Our, for some reason, our PowerPoint and our photographs aren't, um, aren't really working and the programs are crashing on us. So as soon as I do have photos available, I will be, make sure to get them up on the screen. Uh, in the meantime, again, please consider becoming a member of the Crest Butte Museum to uh, be the first to find out about programming like this. We're coming up with many, many more ideas and we're really excited about some of the events that may be coming, that will be coming up uh, over the next few months. Again, please do make a, a donation to support this program as well as to support a scholarship, uh, the, the Vanden Bush Scholarship for a local student uh, and Dwayne, with that, I will pass it off to you. Thank you, Nell, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm going to start off. I've got a book here called Around the Gunnison Country. I'm going to raffle off, and uh, Nell is going to kind of look and see who answers the question first. So I'm going to ask a question before we get started, and whoever answers it first, uh, I'm going to send a book uh, to either him or her to your address. So the question is, the place where the golden spike was driven in to join the rails and establish the first transcontinental railroad in 1869. Whoever can answer that first. In the chat. Uh, okay, we, uh, we got a winner. Who's the winner? Uh, it says Ohio Pass from Jeremy Musket. Is that no, correct? it's not Ohio Pass. We got Promontory, Utah. Who said Promontory? Their name is Galaxy S8. Um, okay, no they need to, they'll need to give you the uh, address because they win. It's Promontory Point, Utah. All right. It so, is great to have everybody aboard here, and uh, we will be talking about ranching tonight. And we've got about 280 people on board, which is fantastic, maybe even a little bit more. And we thank you very much for the scholarship donations. And as Nels mentioned, uh, the earlier programs are, have been taped, and you can get to those and uh, see them and hear them if you want. My first one was on Crested Butte. The second one was on the Black Canyon. And last week, we talked about the silver camps. So today, it is the railroads. Next week, it'll be ranching. And with regard to the railroads, I'm going to start off by a little railroad history, and then we'll move into the Gunnison country. Uh, the year is 1849 and the U.S. is expanding. The Oregon Trail had brought thousands to the Oregon country in the 1840s. And then in 1849, 100,000 people headed to California for that great California gold rush. Getting to the West, however, was an enormous problem. It was 2,000 miles overland from the Mississippi River to California or Oregon. And the trip was fraught with Indians, lack of water, cholera, and it took six to nine months. If one went by water, it was around Cape Horn, the southern tip of South America, and then up the west side, a nine-month trip. Or you could go across the Isthmus of Darien, now the Panama Canal, and then walking and boating 76 miles from the Atlantic to the Pacific through mosquito-infested swamps, and then you would hope to catch a boat to California or Oregon. And sometimes the boat wasn't there. All routes were long, expensive, and dangerous. The United States desperately needed a transcontinental railroad. In the year 1853, Congress appropriated $150,000 for four railroad surveys. 
in the West, and they would pick the best one. In charge of those four surveys was the Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis of Mississippi, future head of the Confederate States of America in the Civil War. Here are the four men. Billy Park surveyed the southern route. New Orleans on the Mississippi River to San Diego on the west coast. Isaac Stevens, the northern route. Duluth, Minnesota on the Great Lakes to Seattle on the west coast. Emil Whipple from the, on the north south central route. Memphis on the Mississippi River all the way out to Los Angeles on the west coast. And the fourth surveyor was a 31-year-old second lieutenant named John Gunnison from Goshen, New Hampshire. Gunnison would look over a central route, which would go from St. Louis to San Francisco. When he left San Francisco, he had 63 men, and he had 18 six-mule wagons. Gunnison followed the Santa Fe Trail out of St. Louis, and then crossed La Vida Pass in Colorado into the San Luis Valley. From there, it was over 10,032 foot high Cochito Pass and into the Gunnison country in September of 1853. As Gunnison headed out of the town of Gunnison today, wasn't there then, of course, he had a tremendous problem crossing the Lake Fork of the Gunnison River west of town. And he avoided the dangerous Black Canyon. He made his way into Utah, where he was killed with seven of his men by Paiute Indians in October. The following year, 1854, Lieutenant E.G. Beckwith, who had been with Gunnison on that expedition the year before, wrote up the report. The Gunnison country and the Gunnison route would not be a transcontinental line because of the high passes, the rugged canyons, and everybody knew about the tremendous snow from earlier travelers. When the Civil War began in 1861, everybody forgot about a transcontinental railroad. But a year later in 1862, the Northern Congress sanctioned the building of a line by the passage of the Pacific Railway Act. However, any building obviously would have to wait until the war was over. When the Civil War ended in 1865, one year later in 1866, work began on a transcontinental railroad. This line would run from Omaha, Nebraska on the Missouri River all the way to Sacramento, California. The Union Pacific led by Grenville Dodge would build west out of Omaha using mostly Irish workers. The Central Pacific run by the Big Four, Leland Stanford, Colas Huntington, Charlie Crocker, and Mark Hopkins would build east using many Chinese workers. Charlie Crocker was the construction boss of the Central Pacific. And when he decided to use Chinese workers, everybody thought he was crazy because these people were five feet two and averaged about 110 pounds. How could they build a railroad? But there were two things about the Chinese that made them maybe the best workers in the world. Number one, they never got sick because of bad water in particular. And that is because their drink of choice was boiled tea. And obviously the boiling of the tea killed all the bacteria and they stayed healthy. And on top of that, when you went into the American River Canyon in the Sierras, the California, Nevada border, these people were put in wicker baskets and lowered down along the canyon walls 100 feet or 200 feet and they drilled holes into the canyon wall and then put in a stick of dynamite at different places and lit the fuse and then had to be taken up. And because they were light, it was pretty easy to do that. And then of course the explosion blew one of the grays you needed to get through the Sierras. So the Chinese were fantastic workers. Three years later, on May the 10th, 1869, at a place called Promontory Point, Utah, near Great Salt Lake, the Golden Spike was driven in. Right before that, the Irish workers and the Chinese workers, a bet was made. And it was made by the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific over which side could lay more track as they closed in on each other in one day. And I can guarantee you, neither the Irish nor the Chinese wanted to lose that bet. And as they approached each other, 
uh, everybody ran with the rails, double time pounding in the spikes. And both sides laid eight miles of track and they went right by each other until it was called, it was called a halt. And it was considered a draw. Magnificent, laying eight miles of track in one day by both sides. Other transcontinental lines followed the Union Pacific, the Northern Pacific, the Southern Pacific, the Atchison, Topeka, and the Santa Fe, and the Great Northern. All lines were subsidized by the federal government with land and money, with the exception of James J. Hill's Great Northern. And he became known as the Empire Builder because he peopled the area as he built. And then the Colorado Gold Rush had occurred in 1859, two years before the Civil War, the great rush of the 59ers. And even though what is now Colorado was then Western Kansas, 100,000 people headed our way. Even though the Colorado Gold Rush was overrated and most people left or did not make it, it soon became obvious that Colorado and the West needed railroads to get supplies in and or out from the mining camps. Now the stage was set for William Jackson Palmer. Born and raised a Quaker in Delaware in 1839. He fought for the North in the Civil War. Then he became a director of the Kansas Pacific Railroad, which ran into Denver. In 1869, Palmer married a girl named Mary Queen Mellon of the famous and rich Steele family in Pennsylvania and he went to London on his honeymoon. And while he was in London on his honeymoon, he read in the paper that a man named Robert Fairley was gonna to talk to the British Locomotive Association and the topic was gonna to be rails of the future. Palmer gave Queen Mellon $200 and sent her shopping and he went to hear Robert Fairley. And Robert Fairley talked about a type of railroad that really didn't exist in the US. It exists a little more in Europe. He talked about narrow gauge railroads, rails of the future. And he said the advantage of narrow gauge railroads were they could go up steeper grades, they could go around sharper curves, they could be built for less money, and even more importantly, they could get into an area faster than a broad gauge railroad. Now, a narrow gauge railroad has tracks that are three feet wide. Broad or standard gauge, standard gauge by the Congress later on because they didn't want different lines to have different gauges because you couldn't join each other. So standard or broad gauge was four feet eight and a half. Before Palmer began building when he came back to the US, a man named William Loveland, the town father of Golden, had started a narrow gauge railroad out of Golden called the Colorado Central. And in 1872, he would build up Clear Creek Canyon into Black Hawk and Central City. And then in 1884, he would build up to Georgetown and the Silver Plume area. And when he got to Georgetown, it was three miles to Silver Plume, and that was too steep a grade for the railroad to go up Clear Creek Canyon. And as a result, the Colorado Central engaged in two loops and the railroad ran 4.7 miles to make up the three and the two loops cut the grade down. And today you can still ride the Georgetown Loop, one of the most famous pieces of trackage in the United States. 4.7 miles between Georgetown and Silver Plume. Palmer was now back in Colorado where he started a new railroad based on what he had heard from Robert Fairley and he called it the Denver and Rio Grande. And it was unique in two ways. Number one, it was narrow gauge. And number two, it was one of the few railroads in the United States ever to run north and south. This one was gonna head out of Denver and go to Mexico City, tapping mines on the west side of the line and farm and ranch produce on the east side. The line ran from Denver to Colorado Springs. Now there was no Colorado Springs when William Jackson Palmer built his line in. There was Colorado City, but Palmer was a Quaker and he didn't believe in gambling and drinking and prostitution and he wanted nothing to do with Colorado City. So he started a new town and that new town is Colorado Springs. 
Today, if you go to Colorado Springs, you can see General Palmer on horseback in the middle of Nevada Avenue. You can go to the Palmer House. You can go to Palmer Park. You could go to Palmer High School. You could go to his great home at Glen Airy. And you could go for a beer at the Antlers Hotel, named for all the antlers that he had shot on the top of deer. So Palmer's the father of Colorado Springs. And then the railroad ran to Pueblo. And at Pueblo, Palmer started a company that he knew he had to have, and that was the Colorado Coal and Iron Company because Palmer knew that he would need coal and he would need steel. Later on, that became known as the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company, one of the great steel manufacturing plants in the United States. Out of Pueblo, the Rio Grande was diverted west, and it was diverted west to tap the great wealth that was opening up in Leadville. However, when Palmer got to a place called Canyon City and the Royal Gorge in 1874, a big fight took place between the Rio Grande and the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. And the Santa Fe hired a gunfighter named Bat Masterson. And in the bottom of the canyon, which only had room for one track, they shot at each other, they tore up each other's tracks, they exploded uh, rails. And the Royal Gorge War went on from 1874 to 78. In 1878, it went to litigation. And the decision by the court was that the Rio Grande would get the line into Leadville and the Santa Fe would get the line into Santa Fe over Raton Pass, New Mexico. Palmer wasted no time. And he built through the Arkansas River Canyon into a new town that he called Salida, which means the exit and then followed the Arkansas River up and into Leadville on July the 23rd, 1880, the camp's first railroad. The main line, however, continued to Poncha Springs, and then over 10,846 foot high Marshall Pass, and into the Gunnison country, going eventually down into Sargent's, Crookston, Doyleville, Parlin, and into Gunnison on August the 6th, 1881. When you went down Marshall Pass, there was an old saying about the railroad uh, looking like a snaking uh, bucket of worms coming down the pass. And people said it doubles in, it doubles out, leaving the traveler still in doubt whether the engine on the track is going on or coming back. Along with building the main line into the Gunnison country, the Denver and Rio Grande also built a branch line 19 miles from Salida to Poncha Springs to Maysville to Arbor Villa to Garfield and to the town of Monarch. And there was a great limestone quarry and you needed lime to make steel at the CF&I works in Pueblo. After a party celebrating the arrival in Gunnison on August the 6th, 1881, Palmer again wasted no time. He built a 28 mile branch to Crested Butte because he knew he needed coal to run a railroad and coal from, for the CF&I steel mills in Pueblo. He also graded a 37 mile branch line into Lake City from Sapanero west of town, but the tracks never got there until 1889 because the boom was already off of Lake City. So the grade in 81, but no tracks until 89. The main line continued west out of Gunnison to Kizar and Iola and Savoia and Sapanero, all now under the Blue Mesa Reservoir before entering the Black Canyon. The Denver and Rio Grande was able to run its line in the canyon from Sapanero to Cimarron, 15 miles. Thousands of men had laid rails over Marshall Pass before they got there. And west of Sargent's, 1,500 men had worked out of 20 grading camps. And at 3.58, the first passenger train rolled into Gunnison behind engine 33 called the Silver Cliff. In Gunnison, a frame depot, 32 by 154 feet was already up, along with a roundhouse, freight depot, and machine shops being built. And now back to the Black Canyon. In the canyon, Italians and Austrians work laying track in the canyon and trouble broke out between the new nationalities in October. Pete Theophile, an Austrian-speaking Italian, 
shot William Hoblitzel, his boss, over not being paid early. Hoblitzel died later that day, and Theophile was tracked in the Black Canyon by Sheriff George Yule of Gunnison, arrested and brought to Gunnison and put in the courthouse for his safety. It didn't work, as a dozen masked men stormed in that night, grabbed Theophile, dragged him down the stairs, and hung him from a livery sign on Tamichi Avenue. 1,100 men work laying tracks in the Black Canyon, going by the Kirikandi Needle and Chapita Falls en route. Ripley Hitchcock, a reporter, rode among ties on a flat car in the canyon and reported on the hotel train parked on a siding opposite the Kirikandi Needle. Now this was a hotel train that had four sides to it, four different uh, levels, and that's where men slept after getting done with their job during the day. And here's what Ripley Hitchcock said, and I'm quoting. Here was the temporary home of 400 men. A little beyond was the working train at the very end of the rails. All along the dumper roadbed, gangs of men were busily unloading and placing ties and rails, or leveling the surface with exactness. Presently, a whistle blew. Six o'clock had come, and the men leaving their tasks scrambled aboard the flat cars, and the train rumbled back to the hotel on wheels. There were swarthy Italians, Irishmen with carroty locks, men of a score of nationalities, begrimed, tattered, gnawed at by the appetite given by labor in the bracing Colorado air, all brethren in a purely animal instinct, a ravenous desire of satisfying hunger. After the meal, they lighted black pipes and drew together. Some rudely mended their garments. In company, and others produced dirty cards and gathered to talk. A few clambered into the narrow board bunks in the cars and drew their blankets up over aching limbs. It was a glimpse of a hard, cheerless life that I had had. When I turned to go back to the construction train, someone struck up a rollicking Irish song and others joined until the canyon walls gave back the chorus. On August the 9th, 1882, the Denver and Rio Grande got to Cimarron and four days later, the first passenger train made its way through the Black Canyon. The Denver and Rio Grande had to come out of the canyon at Cimarron. Palmer's main engineer, Byron Bryant and his crew had gone further into the canyon and found it would be impossible to run tracks in what became known as the Gunnison Gorge. So the Rio Grande came out at Cimarron and then went over Ciro Summit and into Montrose. Meanwhile, the Denver and Rio Grande had built from Gunnison to Almont, Jack's Cabin, Glacier, and into Crested Butte, arriving on November 21, 1881. Nine days later, the Rio Grande was shipping over 80 tons of coal a day, and most of it for its own use. The railroad that raced the Denver and Rio Grande to be first into the Gunnison country was ex-Governor John Evans' Denver South Park and Pacific narrow gauge, known affectionately as the damn slow pulling and pretty rough riding railroad. Evans began the South Park in the early 1870s, and he built from Denver through Morrison, Turkey Creek Canyon, top of Kenosha Pass, through Jefferson Fair Play in South Park, then over Trout Creek Pass, and then he headed up Chalk Creek. Up he came past the new mining camps of Romley, St. Elmo, and Hancock, and then he began to build one of the most famous railroad tunnels in history under Altman Pass. And this was the Alpine Tunnel at 11,523 feet. Workers at the Alpine Tunnel labored under terrible conditions, high elevation, 40 degree below zero temperatures, and heavy snow meant that most lasted only a couple of days or maybe a week at best. Workers blasted the tunnel at both ends, East Portal or Atlantic, West Portal or Pacific, Work went on from 1880 to 1882, as the South Park tried its best to beat the Rio Grande into the Gunnison country. When workers met in the middle of the tunnel, they were 11 hundredths of an inch off. The Alpine Tunnel was 1,771 feet long, with a slight apex in the middle to allow drainage to East Portal. 
1.5 million board feet of false timbering was required in the tunnel, along with another 500,000 board feet of redwood timber. Including approaches at either end of the tunnel built with heavy timber, the Alpine Tunnel measured 2,500 feet or almost a half mile. The cost of building the tunnel was $300,000, a tremendous sum for that time. When trains approach either end of the tunnel, they blew their whistle, which was the signal for the heavy doors to open. The doors kept the snow from drifting in the tunnel. On the west portal of the Alpine Tunnel, there was an engine house, 54 feet wide and 153 feet long, a large coal bin and water tank inside and then a bunkhouse, a storehouse, a section house, and a telegraph office outside. From the tunnel, trains going west crawled along a sheer rock wall which had to be blasted out. A great stone shelf provided a grade for the rails at the Palisades. The stones there were hand cut and with no mortar. At the Palisades, 452 feet long and 33 feet high a monument to the skill and the daring of South Park engineers. From the Palisades, the South Park came around Sherrod Curve, Woodstock, Quartz, and July of 1882 arrived in Pitkin. And then it was down the Tamichi and into Gunnison on September the 2nd, 13 months behind the Denver and Rio Grande. The South Park would then build up the Ohio Creek Valley 15 miles dead ending at the coal town of Baldwin. The railroad graded from Baldwin into Irwin, the once booming camp, not far from Crested Butte, but the Irwin boom had ended and Baldwin remained the end of the line. As Gilbert Lathrop declared in his book on the railroads of the Gunnison country, the Denver South Park had little engines run by big men. Both the Rio Grande and South Park were narrow gauge railroads. Both faced tremendous danger in the Gunnison country. Tremendous danger at the Rio Grande face, especially in the Black Canyon, where avalanches roared down during the winter months and rock slides in the spring. In January of 1883, the snow was four to 10 feet deep in the canyon and the temperature fluctuated between 30 and 40 below. When the January thaw hit, said Gilbert Lathrop, the Black Canyon became a railroader's hell. And I'm quoting now from Gilbert Lathrop. The almost perpendicular north slopes began avalanching great slides over the track and into the Gunnison River. Imagine, if you will, these tiny narrow gauge trains, a snorting little eight wheel locomotive on the head end, dragging four to five cracker box coaches through that 2000 foot deep chasm taking chances on being smashed into matchwood by a thundering snowslide. The great English writer Rudyard Kipling was coming back through the Gunnison country on the end of a world tour. And he rode the Rio Grande through the Black Canyon in 1889, and he was terrified. And he later recalled, and I'm quoting Kipling, we entered a gorge remote from the sun. There was a wonder and mystery about that ride, which I felt until I had to offer prayers for the safety of the train. We seemed to be running into the bowels of the earth next to an irresponsible stream. The Black Canyon was considered a suicide run for engineers and was feared by all of them. The Gunnison Review Press newspaper in 1884 said, and I'm quoting, the fatality of engineers in the Black Canyon during the past year has been enormous. It would seem that engineers are compelled to risk their own lives to save others, and sooner or later, they meet with a violent death. In 1916, a slide 500 feet long above Chapita Falls hit the Rio Grande, knocking two cars into the Gunnison River, killing the messenger, and also Earl Levy, captain of the Pueblo Centennial basketball team. The Black Canyon exacted its final death on May the 30th, 1949, on the final excursion train, just ahead of the abandonment of the line. More than 200 rode the train, but near Cimarron, Anna Love, 65 and from Denver, got off the train to take photographs, 
slipped while taking them, hit her head on rocks, and was swept downstream. The South Park was also beset with problems continually during its history. The Alpine Tunnel was closed from 1888 to 1895 because of a slide 250 feet inside the tunnel on the east side. It was also closed many other times because of heavy snow and avalanches. One of the avalanches came at Woodstock, and that was a stop, a water stop, on the South Park Line midway between the Alpine Tunnel and Pitkin. On the evening of March the 10th, 1884, a South Park train stalled high above the camp and near the tunnel. The vibration caused by the train triggered an avalanche, which roared down the hillside and smashed into Woodstock with trees, boulders, and snow. Woodstock never knew what hit it. Every building in the little camp was crushed and buried because telegraph lines were also knocked down. It was 22 hours before a relief party arrived from Pitkin. 14 people were dead, including Mrs. Marcella Doyle, a cook at the boarding house, and every one of her six children. Bodies were taken to Pitkin by toboggan. Woodstock never revived. Other problems with the South Park involved losing the race to the Gunnison, in the Gunnison country to the Rio Grande and then the end of the Irwin mining boom. The South Park went down in history as a railroad named Desire. The greatest railroad book ever written was done by a man named Mac Poor and was called the Denver South Park and Pacific, complete with fantastic paintings by E.J. Haley. And I'll give you a little personal note here. When I was a young history prof at Western in the early 1960s, I used to go to Denver to study and I used to go to Fred Rosenstock's Denver bookstore on uh, East Colfax. And he had rare books and he had great books. And when you first got in there, Mr. Rosenstock was an old man would kind of follow you around to make sure you weren't going to steal anything. And when I was there about the second time, I said, Mr. Rosenstock, I would love a copy of the Denver South Park and Pacific book. Uh, if you get one, hang on to it. I'd like to buy it. So about a month later, I'm back in the store. I walk in, Mr. Rosenstock sees me, he says, Shh. and we go to the back room. And Mr. Rosenstock said, I got one. It's number 464. They only printed a thousand copies, the railroad club did. And he said, uh, it's yours. I said, how much? Now my take home pay at that time at Western was $325 a month. And Mr. Rosenstock said $3.25, and he wasn't talking about $3.25. So I wrote him out a check for $325, which was a lot of money at that time. And I started out the door. When I got to the door to get on the sidewalk, Mr. Rosenstock tapped me on the shoulder, and he said, you can't leave without having the pictorial supplement. And I said, how much is that? He said $100. So I tore up the first check and wrote another one out for 425 bucks, hoping that my mother and father would never find out what happened. Otherwise, they'd probably have me institutionalized. But I still have the books today, and they're worth a lot more than what I paid for them. But, you know, I'm not going to benefit because Western State's probably going to wind up with the books after I retire. The narrow gauge railroads in the Gunnison country in Colorado pioneered in innovations and science for railroads in the mountains. Narrow gauge railroads themselves were a big innovation, followed by rotaries. Now a rotary was like an airplane propeller on the front end of a engine and it whirled around and kicked snow off the track, a second great innovation. Snow sheds were another innovation, along with flangers which scraped ice and snow off the top and inside of the tracks to avoid a buildup of both on the rail. The railroads of the United States and the West and Colorado led to many great railroad songs, including the wreck of the old 97. I've been working on the railroad, night train to Memphis, city of New Orleans, Orange Blossom Special, Chattanooga Choo Choo, and Casey Jones. In Casey Jones, there's a line that all school children knew when I grew up. 
If you pardon my singing voice, which isn't great, I'm going to give you the line. Well, they gave him his orders in Monroe, Virginia, saying, Steve, you're way behind time. This is not 38, but it's old 97. You must get it into Danville on time. The rest was history. Casey Jones died at the throttle, trying to make up the time. In Western Colorado, Otto Mears became famous as a toll road and railroad builder. He built three short line railroads in an unsuccessful effort to join Uray and Silverton, 23 miles away, only to be stymied by the feared Uncompagre Canyon right out of Uray along today's Highway 550. He later built the Rio Grande Southern, which ran from Ridgeway to Durango and there connected with the Rio Grande Line, which ran 45 miles through the Animas River Canyon and into Silverton. In this long roundabout, he finally connected Uray and Silverton. And today, 200,000 people a year ride the Durango-Silverton train between the two towns. And a postscript. If you want to ride the Galloping Goose narrow gauge, which ran after the Great Railroad days ended, Go to Ridgeway and you can ride it for a half a mile next to the park. The Galloping Goose Railroad was so named because an automobile frame with an 80 horsepower Buick engine pulled four to five cars of produce, cattle, and ore in the 1930s and 40s when the Rio Grande really had shut down. It was called the Galloping Goose because the car wheels never fit very well on the rails. The left wheel would hit the left rail and ricochet and then the right wheel would hit the right rail and ricochet. And the thing went down the track like a galloping goose, breaking a lot of axles en route. Seven of the cars were built and operated, and they are still available today to see. One is in Telluride, one's in Dolores, one's in Ridgeway, one is in the Knott's Berry Farm in California, and three are in the Rocky Mountain Railroad Museum in Golden. Fantastic contraptions. Railroads were very important to the Gunnison country. They allowed ranchers to send cattle out to the Denver stockyards. The first cow shipped out of Western Colorado was shipped out in 1882. From that time on, every October, Gunnison country ranchers shipped cows out to the Denver stockyards. The railroads also offered the only year-round transportation in the Gunnison country for a long time. Until automobiles came and until passes were open in the winter, the railroad was the only way in or out of the Gunnison country. The railroads also became a tourist attraction. The Rio Grande had a sign on the side of its cars, Scenic Line of the West. Everyone wanted to go through the Alpine Tunnel, see the Black Canyon, and see the incredible beauty of the Rocky Mountains. The Denver and Rio Grande often had three engines taking 100 coal cars over Marshall Pass to the steel mills in Pueblo. Coking coal from Crested Butte being essential in converting iron into steel. For 74 years, the Denver and Rio Grande carried passengers, precious metal, coal, timber, cattle, and farm produce in the Gunnison country. Many railroads still run in Colorado today. Amtrak, of course, goes from Winter Park through the Six Mile Moffat Tunnel and into Denver before continuing east. There's the 45 mile Denver to Dur uh, Durango to Silverton line that 200,000 people ride every year. The Antonito, Colorado to Chama, New Mexico line, a train that runs from Cripple Creek to near Victor another running from Leadville to near Fremont Pass, and of course the famous Georgetown Loop from Georgetown to Silver Plume. The day of the railroad in the Gunnison country came to an end shortly after the coal mines of Crested Butte closed in 1952. With no more coal to carry and planes, autos, and buses prevalent, that era ended. In 1955, Paul Brinkerhoff of Salida got the contract to remove the tracks in the Gunnison country. He hired 12 Western State College students, including some football players, and people like Glenn George, Leo Klinker, Bill Schmaltz, and Donnie Miller to do the job. 
The crew started tearing up the tracks at Baldwin up Ohio Creek on May the 1st, 1955, and they finished at Poncha Junction near Salida on November the 1st. A great era ended in 1955 in the Gunnison country. But if you let your imagination run wild, you can still hear the railroad whistle at the Alpine Tunnel, smell the smoke from the engines, hear the avalanches in the Black Canyon, and see those little narrow gauge engines run by big and brave men, braving the canyons and the passes and the wind and the snow. Oh, as we say, those were the days, my friend. And that's it on the railroad. I don't know if Nell's coming back or if the pictures were available. Were the pictures available, Nell? Um, so uh, it's a little different. So what ended up happening for everybody is that uh, we scanned in our pictures to a uh, too high a resolution, which kept crashing our, um, our program. Um, instead, I have the original scans. And what I'm gonna do is I can share them. And if we could just um, run through them real quick, does that sound good? Absolutely, go ahead and do that. And I'm gonna hit the chat thing. If anybody wants to chat with me, go ahead. Go ahead, Nell. Thanks everybody for being on board. I just hit the chat deal here. See if I get any chats. There you go. I'll comment on those. That's South Pass, Wyoming, and that's a caricature of a wagons going west. Next. Get the next one, Nell, if you can. Uh, it's moving a little slow. Let me see. There we go. Yeah, that's a little advertising brochure for the Transcontinental Railroad. Keep going. There is Promontory Point, where the two trains met on May the 10th, 1869, out in Utah. And uh, some of the big boys were going to pound the spike in, but they couldn't do it, so an Irish worker had to do it. Go ahead. There's William Jackson Palmer, the head of the Rio Grande. Next. There's the Georgetown Loop, two loops. Going from Georgetown to Silver Plume, next. There's uh, Marshall Pass, and you can see the train uh, coming up Marshall Pass, one on the east side, uh, both on the east side. Salida towards Gunnison, next. That's the loop again, keep going. There is a trestle as you're coming up Marshall Pass. You can see the work that had to be done to get those trains over ravines. Next. Uh, there is the Monarch Branch. I take that back. That is Marshall Pass again. Bucking snow on Marshall Pass. Next. Now this one was taken from the Colorado Midland, had nothing to do with the Gunnison country ran from Aspen to Leadville, but that is a great picture of the trestle. And just see how far that train would drop if it went off. Next. There is the Rio Grande on the Monarch Branch carrying limestone to the CFNI steel mills. Next. Uh, there uh, is, uh, the bottom one is the Rio Grande coming into Sargent's, and that's the water tank right there. Next. There is uh, Pitkin uh, up above, and that's the South Park coming into the depot at Pitkin. Next. Uh, there we go on the Black Canyon. And uh, you can see the walls, and they're not very high at that point because you're right around the Kirikandi Needle, but they will go up another couple thousand feet. Next. And there again, there's the Kirikandi Needle right across from it on the other side is Chapita Falls. And you can see how narrow the track uh, had to be to, uh, from the wall to the other side of the line. Next. There is a bridge uh, near the mouth of Cimarron Canyon in the Black Canyon. Next. There is Cimarron and the Roundhouse. 
And you, the thing you see on the front of that train is a cow catcher. You didn't want cows to go under the tracks if you hit them and knock the uh, train off the track. So this thing hit them and bumped them off to the side. Next, there is Cimarron on the bottom and on the top. And that's where the Rio Grande had to come out of the Black Canyon. Next, there's Crested Butte. That's the train coming into Crested Butte and it's got a lot, a lot of coal heading towards the CFNI steel mills. And that's the depot that still exists today on the left. Next. I love this shot. Uh, chickens are hanging out on the railroad track in the 1940s by the depot. Next. That is the inside of the Alpine Tunnel. When I first got here for about 10 years, you could get into the tunnel by sliding down about 20 feet and then walking. And you could walk till a rock slide was near the east side. And uh, you had to have hip boots on. And this one is where the tracks ran and you can see the woodwork. Next. There is the train coming out of the east side of the Alpine Tunnel going to Atlantic, Romley, St. Elmo, and Hancock. Next. There is that engine house that is on the west side of the Alpine Tunnel. Next. There's the Palisades, 452 feet long, 33 feet up and down, no mortar. Next. There's another great shot near the Palisades, Denver South Park. Next. There is a great painting by E.J. Haley and Mac Poor's book on the South Park, and that's entitled Night Train at the Alpine Tunnel. It's fantastic. I got a chance to meet all those guys, Haley Kindig and Mac Poor, and I was very happy to meet them. Next. And there is one that is on Boreas Pass that, uh, you know, not near our area, but I thought it was a great painting by Haley showing the trains on different tracks at Boreas Pass between Fair Play and Breckenridge. Next. There is a train, the Denver South Park train coming into Pitkin. Next. Oop, we saw that one before. Next. There's the Woodstock slide. Killed 14 people. That's the aftermath of it. One of the buildings that was crushed. Next. There they are taking the bodies in on skis with a laid on top of toboggans. Next. There is a, one of the galloping gooses. And that's when they are pulling up tracks. And this happens to be right around Gunnison. You can see the Maurer Lumber Company in the background, and that would be near the depot of today. I think that's the last one, isn't it, Nell? Uh, no, this one uh, was from last time, so we're done. Thanks, everybody, for being on board. Anybody wants to chat with me, I'd love to see. Uh, here's Joe Lynn. What is the estimated value of goods that travel through the Alpine Tunnel? Uh, Joe Lynn, I would say millions. I don't have any figure on that, but a lot of ore, a lot of cattle, a lot of passengers went through. Good to have my uh, great captain on board. <laughs> and just moving up uh, through the questions, uh, what is the estimated, oh, we just did that one. Have, I have heard that the road to the west side of the Alpine, is ton of the Alpine Tunnel is closed, correct? Yeah, yeah, it is. They had a rock slide about five years ago and the Forest Service claims they don't have enough money to clear it. I'm a little chagrined about that. All right, from Mark Walker. My question has nothing to do with this evening's presentation, but how many students and coaches do you estimate that you've taught over the years at Western State University? Oh, wow. Well, 37 years and probably at least uh, you know, 50 to 60 a year, so. I don't know, 1,500, 2,000? That's impressive. Um, Kenneth Jess Jessen uh, commented, not necessarily a question, but he commented, commented, 
Rio Grande Southern number 20 will be steamed up and running August 1st and 2nd at the Colorado Railroad Museum. Oh, thank you, Ken. Yeah, thank you, Ken. Uh, Jeremy Musket asks, Gunnison and Colorado have tons of dirt roads. Is the railroad responsible for the majority of these, the logging industry, or something else? No, you know, I'll tell you what's responsible for a lot of the dirt roads. If you go south of town, almost all of those came from the uranium mining boom. Uh, the rest of them were logging roads or mining roads to get the ore down from the mine to the, uh, to the mills or to the town. Next is, uh, did you say there was a line from Uray to Durango which did not go through Silverton? Yeah, that's right. To a, to a, they couldn't make the Uncompagre Canyon out of Uray, so Otto Mears built the Rio Grande Southern from, it went from uh, Ridgeway and then over Dallas Divide, Telluride, Trout, uh, Trout Lake, Rico, Dolores, Durango, Cortez Durango, and then used the 45 mile line to get into Silverton. So Otto Mears went 187 miles to make up the 23, which would have been a direct shot from Uray to Silverton. Okay, that question was from Benedict. Uh, this one is from Adam. Where in Crested View is the old depot? Well, Nell can answer that. It's uh, as you come into town and you hang a right, it's just east of town. What do you think, Nell? About six blocks? Um, it's like the uh, cross street of 7th and Elk Avenue. So just a block and a half uh, down from 6th Street at the four way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they got a loading dock there. What, what is it today, Nell? The loading dock? No, what is the building used for today? Oh, uh, the building, the depot today uh, now belongs to the town. It's just been restored and you can rent it for um, your own personal event. And also the High Country uh, Citizens Alliance has their offices there. That's really nice. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, we've got more questions coming in from Natasha. Uh, is that awesome engine house on the west side of the Alpine Tunnel still standing? Uh, what was the name of the house? Uh, she said the awesome engine house. No, the engine house has gone down. You can still see the foundation. What is this? still there, and Ray Rosman for the Forest Service did a tremendous job with volunteers. You have the old telegraph office, and it's got a lot of photos and artifacts inside of it but the engine house is no more. Uh, Kevin asks, what happened to the old water tank that was in CB into the 1970s? Yeah, you know, that's something they should have restored, uh, Kevin, but uh, it was uh, falling down and they ultimately took it down and I don't know where the boards uh, went to. Uh, you know, you might talk to some of the old timers, but that was a big, controversy. A lot of people thought they should have tried to restore it. Um, another question from our friend Mark Walker. With the excellent railroad lines in the Gunnison area and the importance of tourism, why do you think that none of the lines were opened and adapted for tourists like the line in Georgetown? You know, Mark, that's a good question. When, when the uh, coal shut down and the railroad uh, tracks were taken out, we lived in a different time, and I think everybody felt that with the modern means of transportation, uh, the railroads really weren't very good, and nobody really recognized the value of tourism at that point. Uh, but just imagine uh, what it would be worth today if you could take a train through the Alpine Tunnel or take the ski train from Gunnison up to the Crested Butte area. All right. Uh, Lori asks, what did they do with all the tracks that they removed from the Gunnison country? They took them to Salida and then Paul Brinkerhoff sold them and many of them wound up in South America to be used for railroads there. Okay, um, any more questions? It look like the last one for the moment. I just want to remind everyone uh, to please to support this program by going to CrestviewMuseum.com to make a donation. Part of your donation will also go to the Vandenbush Scholarship. 
uh, for a local student looking to go to college here uh, in the next couple of years. Um, Oh, yep, we got another question come in from Michael Guerreri. What year was the railroad line taken up between Gunnison and Crested Butte? Was it all removed in a single year? Yeah, they were from May 1 to November 1 of 1955, all the tracks were taken out. So now before we get off, I'm looking at my chat uh, room here, if that's what they call it. And it's great to see all the people who are on it. And I want to thank all of you. It's always great to hear from some of my athletes and some of my ex-students. So uh, keep up the good work and we'll have a good performance uh, next time on ranching. Mm -hmm. So thank all of you. Also, uh, the winner of Dwayne's uh, quiz earlier today, uh, your name is just listed as Galaxy S8 in our, um, in our chat and uh, as a, as a uh, attendee. If you could get in touch with us, uh, you can email curator at crestedbuttemuseum.com. Again, that's- Put it on the chat it. box. Yeah, I can do that. Um, and we'll make sure that that book gets to you. Um, unfortunately, because your name is Galaxy S8, I can't do much to reach out to you. Just let us know. All right, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dwayne. Yeah, thank you, Nell. Um, and again, the recording of this will be available at crestviewmuseum.com. All right, we're going to sign off, and we'll see everybody next week for the railroad.